I don't know about you, but I feel challenged by those statistics. I feel challenged by those statistics. Sometimes, though, you need those home truths, right? Sometimes you need Jesus to look at you and to tell you who you really are. And uh, we, can, we can have encouragement today. We can have hope today because we are not alone in this. As, as I look to the scripture today, I find another individual in a similar situation to us who heard some things from Jesus that perhaps were challenging. Can I share that with you this morning? Allow me, if you would, to just, to just pray as we go to the word. Father God, this is your time. Be God all by yourself, we pray. Amen. Turn with me, if you have your Bible, to Mark chapter 9 as we continue this theme, uh, uh, looking at what God has called us to do. And I want to talk to you this morning about the first Christian camp meeting. Is that okay? Did you know there was a Christian camp meeting in the Bible? Did you know this? You, you, okay, you're going to find out this morning about that. The first Christian camp meeting, Mark chapter 9, and I want to read to you verses from verses 2. Mark chapter 9. Verse 2, I'm in the New King James Version Bible this morning. If you have it, say, praise the Lord. If you're still trying to find it, say, help me, Jesus. Okay, Jesus will help you. All right, let's go. Mark chapter 9, verse 2, it says, now after after six days, after what? Okay, you're with me. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth could whiten them. Verse 4, and Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three chalets, no, sorry, not three chalets. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Verse 7, and a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw the uh, and no, they, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. And the beginning of verse now, 9, now, as they came down from the mountain. Now, as I was reading this text, maybe you have a similar question in your mind. Why does Mark start this story here by telling us, after six days. I'm thinking, six days after what? Well, I'm glad you asked. If you were to look back, and we don't have time this this morning or this afternoon, I'm not sure we are, but we don't have time right now to to really dig into this. But if you go back and look in chapter 8, in chapter 8, the worst situation of Peter's experience as a disciple of Jesus has just happened. Jesus has been in Caesarea Philippi, and, and, and he's uh, been, been talking to his disciples, and he's been asking his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And you remember the story. Some say Elijah, and some say one of the other prophets. And then he turns the screw, and he says, but who do you say that I am? Looking at the disciples. And Peter speaks up, because he's always speaking up. He speaks up for the disciples, and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, fantastic, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father who's in heaven. And you can imagine that Peter at this moment, we already know that Peter struggles with a little bit of pride and he struggles with a desire to be seen as first among his peers. You can imagine that he he swells a little bit as Jesus publicly before the disciples says, no, 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 Peter has direct communication from my father in heaven but not five minutes later you know how the story ends right not five minutes later after Peter makes this declaration Jesus starts to unpack what it really means to be the Christ the Messiah the Son of God and he starts to tell them I'm going to I'm going to go to Calvary I'm going to go to the cross I'm going to be killed the rabbis and the rulers and the Pharisees and the, and the scribes are going to reject me but I will rise the third day and Peter now you can imagine this he's feeling good he's feeling he's feeling filled with the Holy Ghost he's feeling full of knowledge he says oh Jesus you clearly haven't been reading your Bible, Jesus. 
You, you obviously, Jesus doesn't understand prophecy because, because when I read the Old Testament, I see that the Messiah is triumphant and I see that the Messiah's enemies are put under his feet. So, so, so you must be misunderstanding Jesus. And so Peter, wanting to be a good Christian, he doesn't want to blow Jesus out in front of everyone. He says, let me take him aside. Can I just pause here? Sometimes you ought to just take the person aside. That's just for three people. Let, let me take him aside and rebuke him there. So Jesus, can we, can we have a word? Far be this from you, Lord. And Jesus looks at Peter and says these faithful words. Get thee behind me who? Wow. Five minutes. Hearing the voice of God, five minutes later, speaking for Satan. And what was it that Peter was doing? Why was it that Jesus said he was speaking for Satan? Here's, hear this, don't miss this. It's because Peter was trying to prevent Jesus from going to the cross. Don't miss that, don't miss that. We, we often think that the temptations of Satan for Jesus were primarily about getting Jesus to sin. That would have been a bonus, but Satan would have been able to stay in control of this planet if he could simply get Jesus to go back to heaven without going through the cross. And so Peter has his spiritual life rocked. He's just been called Satan by Jesus. And six days after that, the pen of inspiration says, not just Peter, but all the disciples are disturbed and confused by Jesus' suggestion that he's going to die. Bear in mind, at that time, they did not understand that the Messiah should die. And so for, for six days, they're walking around confused, not sure what's going on. Their, their leader, their friend, perhaps the most talented of them, has been called Satan. They don't know what's going on. And then Jesus decides, you know what, let me call Peter, James, and John, and let's go to camp meeting. And so they hike. Ellen White tells us that they start in the evening, and so by the time they get to the top of the mountain, it's nighttime. And, and she says that Jesus is there pleading and praying and crying out to the Father because now he has his eyes firmly fixed on Jerusalem and, 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 and his passion, which is going to take place there. And he's pleading for strength, not just for himself, but for his disciples. And just like in the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples get weary while they start praying with him. They get weary and they fall asleep. And while that while they are sleeping, she says that Jesus appeals to the Father. And I love this description. When you have a chance, go read it in Desire of Ages. She says Jesus appeals to the Father, please, if you could just give them a glimpse of who I was before the world began. If they could just see me in my glory, if they could just see me in my majesty, if they could just see me in my divine power, it would give them faith when they see me on the cross. And the Father answers his prayer. And she says, light breaks out of heaven. And then she says that divinity in Jesus, I love this, flashes through humanity. And so you have glory coming down from heaven met by glory coming up from the ground. And as the two meet, there's this amazing explosion of light and it wakes the disciples up. And somehow in the way that only God can do, Moses and Elijah come down. I mean, you think the camp meeting speakers are good, but imagine if Moses and Elijah were headlining. There they are, talking with Jesus, and the disciples wake up. And Peter's listening, and, and eventually he figures out what's going on, and he thinks, oh, if only we could stay here on this mountaintop. If only we could stay here where we can see Jesus as he truly is. If only we could stay here hearing the words from Moses and Elijah. If we could stay here, we'd never get things wrong again. I'd probably never end up being called Satan again. If I could stay in this moment, if, if, if we could stay here, things would be perfect. Have you ever thought that? I, I know you think that. That's why you're here at camp meeting. Can I be honest? No one came for the chalets, right? No one was like, man, I, I need to get some more of that chalet action. I mean, that's why you're here, because you're like, it's, it's more comfortable here. 
<laughs> then in the chalet, right? No, no one really came for the food. I mean, I'm sure you cook fantastic food in your chalet, but, but it's complicated. It's not like at home. You don't have all the things and all your spices. I mean, some of you did bring your kitchens. But, 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 but it's not the same. The reason we come here is because when we get to this mountaintop, we catch a glimpse of Jesus. We see him glorified. We see something of him that we don't seem to see in the valley. And truth be told, many of us came to camp meeting having acted like the devil in weeks and months before. Let's, let's speak the truth this morning. Many of us are here thinking about the mistakes we've made and, and the arguments we've had and, and the ways we've misrepresented Jesus. Jesus, and there's something about this week together. Somehow our prayers get more meaningful, and, and somehow we sing with more expression, and, and somehow the old Bible takes on new meaning, and we think, if only we could stay here. We say things like, it's a, it's, it's a glimpse of heaven on earth. Jesus, let, let, let's stay here. We'll, we'll, we'll build a, a tabernacle, one, one, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And now notice, Peter is so excited, he's already forgotten the other nine brothers who, who didn't come to camp meeting. Now, now I know no one is judging the others who didn't come to camp meeting. And I know, I know, I know we never do that. But, but, but he's already, in the glory he's experienced, he's forgotten everything else. But Jesus doesn't stay on the mountaintop. He comes down. And when he comes down, Mark chapter 9 from verse 14, you know the story well. He runs smack bang into the devil. So, so, so this is a devil sandwich, right? right. You, you have Peter being called Satan beforehand. Right after the transfiguration, you have uh, this young boy who is possessed by a demon and the other disciples who have been left behind who didn't go to camp meeting like they should have done. They, they don't have the power to deal with the devil. And so you have these two manifestations of Satan's power. And I can imagine Peter thinking, this is what I was saying when I thought we should stay on the mountain. After all, check it in scripture. You will find that with the exception of the time when Satan takes Jesus to a high place uh, to show him the world, with that exception, Satan somehow never seems to have power over Jesus in mountains. Go back and check it. Uh, whenever Satan is messing with people, it's always in valleys. I don't know. There's probably more theology that I don't understand. Maybe it's something to do with the fact that God himself lives on the mountain. And maybe something about mountains Satan recognizes as a place he can't go. I don't know. But for some reason, when you look at the ministry of Christ, when he's in the mountain, he's either praying or he's preaching. Powerful things are happening. He's feeding 5,000. But it's in the valleys that the devil is active. And I can imagine Peter saying, see, this is the problem. If we could just stay in the mountain, everything would be fine. But he made one fatal assumption, and I think we make the same thing. We assume that Jesus has called us so that we can have powerful Christian spiritual experiences and everything can be fine. We assume that, that, that the purpose of the Christian experience is to get closer to Jesus and to see him high and lifted up and, and to become like him and, and, and just be more like him and be with like-minded people. But beloved, just before being transfigured, Jesus said to the disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, they must first take up their what? They have to take up their cross and follow me. We have to go back to lock horns with the devil. And Jesus comes down. And the disciples are in disarray. And they've been trying now. Ellen White says it's been over a night. So it's, so it's been a whole night. It's, been, it's, it's the next day now. They come down. And, and this father, he comes to Jesus saying, I tried. I brought my child to your disciples. They couldn't do anything. And, and they're embarrassed. And, and, and Jesus is looking at the lack of faith. And, and, and he speaks a word. And he casts the devil out. But here's the point I want to leave you with this morning. There are some situations waiting for you at home after camp meeting. 
You can't escape. If you have come to camp meeting hoping that somehow on this mountaintop, in this spiritual environment, God will do something and will just fix everything so that when you come back down, it'll all be good. You are kidding yourself. Right now, while you're seeing Jesus high lifted up, the devil is messing with people who are helpless. And Jesus is wanting us to leave this mountaintop to take the power of the experience we've had and change lives in the valley. Ellen White, commenting on this passage of scripture. Give me. This is in Desire of Ages, page 430. Hear what she says. She says, not alone upon the mountaintop with Jesus, in hours of spiritual illumination, is the life of Christ's servants to be spent. Did, did you catch that? Did, did I mention this was Ellen speaking? Did, did I just hear Ellen say, too much Bible study is a bad thing? Did, 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 did you? Let me read it again because it seems like you are. Okay, let me. Not alone upon the mountaintop with Jesus. In hours. In what? Of spiritual illumination is the life of Christ's servants to be spent. Let's be real for a moment. Many of us are thinking that if we could just simply get a few more hours upon the mountaintop with spiritual illumination with Christ, everything will be better. Sister Girl is telling you that's not the, 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 the silver bullet you think it is. Hear me carefully. Don't, don't misunderstand this. Some of you are looking at me like, uh-oh. He's turned the corner. Stay with me. Stay with me. I'm not saying time with Jesus is not important. I'm saying that the goal is not simply to just be with Jesus and just, just alone. Watch what she says. Next, next sentence. There is a work for them down in the plains. Souls whom Satan has enslaved are waiting for the word of faith and prayer to set them free. Can I say it in 2016 English? If all you do is spend time with Jesus, but it doesn't set people free, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. And, and I know the tension as I'm closing. I, I know the tension because you're saying, but, but pastor, and I'm saying it to myself, but God, you... You don't realize how much of a mess my life is. This, this week is like, is like the one week where I get real peace, where, where, where I'm, I'm really like the person I feel I'm supposed to be. I get that. But here's the point. There are people in greater bondage than you. I know every now and then you might speak like Satan, but you aren't possessed by Satan. There are people who are in bondage. And we sometimes sit here trying to perfect ourselves a little bit more, polish ourselves a little bit more, while others are dying and going to a Christless grave. She says we have to go down to the plain. And we must set free those who are enslaved by Satan. But here's the good news. See, Peter wanted to stay on the mountain because he wanted to stay with Jesus. But here's the good news. Jesus goes with you down to the valley. Oh, you missed your shout. Jesus doesn't just live on mountaintops. See, this is the beautiful thing about the, the incarnation. In the past, people had to go to God. They had to go to the temple, and the temple was on a mountain. You had to hike to God. But when Jesus came, God came to us, and he died, and he was resurrected, and he put out his Holy Spirit, and now he lives in us. So everywhere we go... He goes. And the Bible says, John says, that the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. Literally, it means he camped with us. Thank you, Lord. That means that when Jesus is with me, I can have camp meeting anywhere I am. And I just wish there were two or three people here this morning who are willing to thank God and say, I may have had a good week. I may have experienced some blessings, but I'm not going to let the blessings stay here. I'm going to take the blessings with me and I'm going to set some people free right where I am. I am. Jesus goes with you. 
And if God be for you, who can be against you? Who can be against you? It, it, are there just two people who you have some real situations waiting for you at home? And you want to say, Pastor, would you pray for me that, that, that I would have faith in Jesus that as I leave this mountaintop, he will go with me and he will set the people free if I put my faith in him. Is there anyone who wants to say that this morning? Father God, we see the raised hands. Thank you for camping with us. We've come to this camp meeting as if uh, we've come to camp with you, but see, sometimes forget you are already camped with us. For the angel, thank you, Lord, the angel of the Lord encampeth around those who fear him and delivers them. Lord, we're praying for power to deliver us. We have situations in our lives. We sit here this morning all, all, all stayed and, and peaceful, but, but some of us know that the devil is running amok in our families. Our children are messed up. Our grandchildren are all over the place. They're in prison. They're on drugs. Our church families are pulling themselves apart. We just saw t statistics, Jesus, that we're losing people after we win them, but we still believe that the Jesus who sets people free free in the, in the New Testament can set them free in 2016. And so we're going to leave this place in faith that Jesus goes with us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.